I remember being on a roll for like two years, but after a while, we all turned around like, hello, somebody drop this album, please. We on the charts for 13 weeks. You can check my lifestyle and see that I'm quite wild. 728 night child, universal and versatile. You study my style, trying to live spiritual and long like the now. I can see right now, y'all will never understand me. I call my best friend, my family until they cross me. Alcohol the weed cost me, so I limited. Running it over like in the year. A made figure way bigger than the mother cat you let her see I'm getting paid like I'm supposed to My homies call me on my mobile wanna hang We still close to it You know it again, miss you when I don't talk. When our tongues touch, have a play, boys. Dig it much, roll a Dutch. Let me tell you, it turns me on. Oh, yeah. One talk, same way. Making our way. Every time you like it, we can't wait. Anywhere. I can love you. I live like a possibility. I made figure way bigger than the one that you love to see. Growing up in my household in Atlanta, okay, I'm the oldest of four. My dad was a insurance agent during the day, hustle at night. My mom was a hard worker. You know, she worked two or three jobs sometimes. Me and my brother and my cousin stayed in my crib. We used to rehearse and do music all the time as a kid. Any song that came out, whether it was BBD, TLC at that time was popping, ABC, Criss Cross, you name it. We were just rehearsing in the mirror and always wanted to do music. My mom and dad, they, um, they supported me, you know, growing up. If I said I wanted to do something, play sports, play music, do music, they were always there to support me, so I definitely appreciate that. At a young age, I knew I wanted to be a star, I knew, but I knew the work it took to put into it. I was willing to do the work. It started with my mom. Um, my mom used to take me to the uh, hair salon with her, and I would perform for the ladies in the, in the, in the hair salon. So there's all these beautiful ladies getting their hair done, and I'm in there just acting the fool, but that's when I learned like I wasn't shy. You know, my dad was my first hero. Shout out to Big Zane. That was the first person I saw, male figure in my life that, um, you know, he taught me how to be a man, how to deal with women, how to deal with the streets. Um, you know, just gave me that confidence as a, as a young man. If you know my dad, he's been in the industry for years. He was my first manager. So he pretty much taught me everything street business that I know. My second hero, I have to say, would be Pop. I was born in Yonkers, New York, but I was raised in Atlanta, Georgia. And um, I came to Atlanta at a time when Atlanta was just popping with the music. Criss Cross was out and he was number one. ABC and Criss Cross, those are like my number one pop pop groups and pop songs I used to listen to. You know, we used to be rehearsing in the room. I used to put my pants on backwards, you know? So I used to think I was Criss Cross. I wanted to be Mac Daddy, you know? They inspired me, like more than Tupac. Criss Cross inspired me to really want to rap because they was kids and I identified with them. Cause music wasn't that big in Atlanta. Criss Cross had just came out, ABC. So anything that was popping in Atlanta, I just jump on it immediately. They used to do these big talent shows around Atlanta. And um, we end up in the talent show um, with Usher Raymond. And we end up getting second place and getting signed to RCA Records. So that's how the whole chronic thing came about. Boom, tricky, zoom, the track like boom. To the dip when I slip clips to the list and start spraying. About to make more money. We got signed when I was about like 10 years old, 11 years old, but I was probably, we were on the label just sitting ducks for about three years. Um, I, don't, I think we were just a write off. I don't think they actually planned on doing nothing. At 12, 13, I had a record deal. You know, I was young, so I was moving around in spots where I was actually able to meet Pac, and he walked up and he like, oh, come here, y'all rap. So I kicked my verse for him. My brothers were scared to rap, but I wasn't scared. I'm like, da, 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 da. And he's like, yo, he remind me of me. He remind me of me, yo, get my numbers, man. Whatever they need, I got them. And if you knew Pop, you knew that's how he was. Even if he was joking, yo, you remind me of me. It made me feel like I got the stamp. Like, I got a stamp from Pop. Like, the greatest per rapper in the world saying you remind me of me. I think for a kid, that would inspire any kid. I never took being compared to Tupac as a, as a bad thing. I feel like he loved his people. I love my people. I feel like he loved women. You know, I love women. And I feel like he wanted to leave the earth with something before he left. And that's all I'm trying to do. So if you want to compare me to the greatest to ever do this rap thing, then I, I got to take that as a compliment. After the chronic thing happened and the label folded and everything, uh, my brother and my cousin, they wanted to do other things. And me, I just had this burning sensation where I just always wanted to rap. I knew it wasn't over for me. Um, and I'm not a follower. Like, just because you quit don't mean I'm going to quit. So 
I just kept going and it turned into what it turned to. I met 112 through an old manager of mine named Kevin Wells. My man K Wells, he was working, he was managing 112 at the time. And they were doing their second album, Room 112, and they were doing a song called Anywhere. Kevin Wells had been a part of my career as, a, as an artist in Chronic. He had actually managed Chronic for a little while. I ran into Kevin Wells again in the club, and I had one of my dad's suits on. I was like 15, 17, trying to sneak in the club. And he was like, what you doing right now? I'm like, man, my music, I'm back, I'm solo, what's up? So he was like, all right, we'll just come to the studio tomorrow. So I went to the studio and I rapped for him. And he was like, damn, you ain't miss a step. Well, I'm over here managing 112. We're working on a new album. I'm gonna bring you by the studio. So he brought me by the studio the next day and 112 played the Anywhere track. And I was like, wow, I'm like, I need like 15 minutes to go home and just write this real quick. So I went home and um, locked myself in a room for like 15 minutes. I wrote the song. Then they came and got me in a black 500. They gave me 15 minutes to write that verse. It was like, can you come in there and do it real quick? I was like, cool, put it down. The next day, Puff called me like, it's crazy. You're going to put it down. That's great. Yeah. That was my first plaque I ever got, double platinum plaque. When 112 sing to you, what kind of feeling do it bring to you? I bump hard to you, Sam being mean to you. I know the ice really clean to you. A true player is what I seen to you. And if you want it, we can do it. Room 112, Anywhere featuring Lil Zane. Uh, what was it like being on the set of Anywhere? You want the real answer? The whole time I was like this. Damn, girl, you finna wear that? I'm fresh out the hood. I'm, I'm fresh out of Atlanta. You bring me in Miami around all these beautiful women, these cars. It was a great experience. The raunchiness of the video, I think, is what worked. I think that was the first video where people was in the shower, like Slim was in the shower. Mike had the girl on the counter in the kitchen. Like, we wanted to show every place that you could possibly do the nasty in your house. So it worked for him. Definitely worked for me too. So let's get away to get away. You getting hot, baby, please don't run away. I got a crib on the beat, fall that away. Is your first key? The way I got on party wreck is um my manager was starting his own label. He wanted to, you know, find a label situation. We had a relationship with Puff because I was on the Anywhere song, so naturally, I didn't have a record deal. Puff wanted to sign me, so they pulled me in this room, and they straight up asked me, you know? He was like, yo, I want you to sign with me, but Puff wants you to sign with Bad Boy. I'm just like, yo, Diddy, if I have a problem with you, I ain't gonna be able to find you. You got jets and stuff. If I have a problem with him, I can go to his house. So I was like, I'm gonna stick with where, I'm gonna stick with my man, you know? And I think that Diddy respected that. Don't make stupid decisions when you grow up, kids. <laughs> I'm just, don't make decisions with your heart, make them with your mind. Andrew Shack, he was um, president of Priority Records at the time. I had a condo in Atlanta with a studio in it, so he came to the condo and he went through all the songs and he was like, this is it. We about to make him bigger than life. He showed us that contract and that contract said 15 million. And I was like, oh man, you know what I'm saying? So that's what made us decide to go party. And we had the creative control. We had a bunch of people trying to sign us, but some people wanted to give you 20 million, but they wanted all the creative control. Some people wanted to give you two million and half the creative control. So we found a situation that was best for us. So we was like, yo, we're gonna go with this, you know? You right. slipped that in there, that Sean Connery. What, what's, what's going on? Oh yeah, we're doing a little movie. I got my first little acting gig. We shot it out in the Bronx. All right. Give it up yeah. for that. The first movie I ever ended up doing was Finding Forrester. I was at MTV or BT or something across the street doing an interview, and I seen a line of people sitting outside of a McDonald's, and they like, oh, this little Zane, I'm like, what's going on? They're like, are we auditioning for a movie? And I'm like, I got about 10 minutes, you think I can cut through this line real quick and get on? So I cut through the line, and I actually walked through the door, and they were really filming, like, y'all filming right now? And I'm like, oh, shoot. Hey, my name's Lil Zane, around the corner of MTV. I got a, the hugest song in the world right now, can I audition for this movie? The dude says, sure. I come in there, I kill it. About a week later, they called me like, yo, you gonna be in this movie with Buster Rhymes, Sean Connery. I was like, wow, so that's how I got that. I didn't know who Sean Connery was. Like, I knew who he was when I went and told my grandmother. My grandmother never moves. When I told her Sean Connery, she almost did a backflip. My first album was called Young World of the Future. 
It came out in 2000, like August 22nd, 2000. That'll always be like a special day to me. First single off the album was called Calling Me. Calling Me was originally produced by Akon. This life I live with my, that was Akon singing that. My manager at the time, he was trying to build his label up and he had some, some producers signed to him named Mr. Fist and Diggy Dom. So one day I just was in the studio sleep and they came in and they had switched the whole beat. They took Akon off the chorus and they put 112 on the chorus. And I ain't gonna lie, at first I didn't like it. Then I'm sleeping in the studio one day and it comes on loud. And when it came on, it was like, don't, 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 don't. And it woke me up. I can't lie, it sounded so good. My album didn't come out till like a year later. I remember being on a roll for like two years, promoting Calling Me, the first single. But it didn't seem like two years because it was still going. But after a while, we all turned around like, dog, we need to put an album out. It made it dope because it's a classic album and I, the experience from on the tour helped the album. But I, I think the album just should have came out a little earlier. And the, album, the single was platinum already. The single was on number one on the charts for like 13 weeks. So, hello, somebody drop this album, please. We on the charts for 13 weeks. Cats put them big face bills in the air. My post sell more sex there. Love we mean this. Been all around the world. Turn the squares into true place. But then it comes time to do the Calling Me video. We wish I had the Calling Me video in Miami. I, am, I wanted to invite all these stars out, so. Everybody you see in that video, I flew them out, probably paid them to come, put them in nice hotels. So most of the budget was used on just taking care of everybody. And we just decided to shoot a video like while we throwing a party. So that's how the Calling Me video came about. I'm probably like the biggest artist in the game at this time. You know, it was a lot of anticipation. Then after that, Came Dr. Doolittle 2. Dr. Doolittle 2. Yes. You June 22nd. That's when it drops. June 22nd. June 22nd. Actually, Thank her boyfriend is somebody who comes here all the time, Lil Zane. Stop. Uh, Zane, she uh -oh. Big up, Lil Zane. What up, Zane? Yep. Director Steve Carr was actually the, he directed the Money Stretch video. I knew just from seeing how he was shooting my video, I'm like, this is different. And I turned to him and I say, you're going to be doing movies one day, dog. Just remember me, man. You're going to be doing movies one day. So, boom. He ends up directing Dr. Doolittle 2. And that's, guess who he calls? Your boy! <laughs> Your boy! And it just goes down like that, and the history was wrote. I just wanna have some fun tonight. Sorry, baby, but. Tell me, can you make None Tonight, my, my second single off the album, which I gotta explain to the fans, it took so long for that None Tonight to drop because Calling Me was doing so well that. The label didn't, they weren't even thinking about a second single. They were just going off calling me. Then they put the album out and the album started doing good. And I turned around, I'm like, yo, the album been out six months. We need a, we need a new single. So None Tonight was the last song I did on my, on my first album. And I just remember being rushed. I need to have this album done by 12 o'clock tonight. And I just remember getting in the studio and I heard the beat and I kind of freestyled something. And, and None Tonight came about and it ended up being a second single. So What Must I Do also got Akon on it. And I say that because he's so huge now. People don't even know, like, that's been my dog for a while. Like, we've been doing music. And, um, you know, I think that's just some things that my fans might want to know. 106, I got a new yep. album out of stores right now. It's called Young World of the Future. If you don't have it, go get it. Right. And I'm also All working right. out this little tour. I got a little surprise tour that we working out for y'all. So y'all see me in New York real soon. I went on a Scream tour in like 2001, I think. The dates were sold out already, but I think I just, I think I ended up because I was heating up. I think I was, I was hot at the time and I think they needed just somebody else to, to headline with Bow Wow. After they ran it once or twice, they, they noticed like, you know, sometimes you just try something, you're like, okay, it's missing something. So I, I lucked up and they put me on a Scream tour. Tension between me and Bow I wouldn't say tension, because we was kids, you know. I think what happened with me and Bow was just, you got two young kids that's superstars. Like, I mean, he had his fans, I got mine. So if you put them together, I mean, it's going to be, you know, it's, we, we both got egos, we both running around like we the shit. And this is why I think it just really went crazy. So Harbaugh, I think it was, we both came out the trailer to shoot and we had the same jersey on. So I was like, uh, I'm from Atlanta, you gotta take that jersey off. And he was like, nah, you gotta take your jersey off. So I guess we talked to Jermaine, and Jermaine is like, well, he is from Atlanta, you are from Ohio. So they made him switch, and I think from there, he was like, <laughs> but they was like, I ain't dealing with this guy no more. But again, that was, that was kid stuff, you know what I mean? We grown now, I see Bow Wow, you know, I, I get on his Instagram, and you know, 
everything he's doing. I make sure I support and congratulate him. If you're watching 106 in Park, BET's Top 10 Live, it's time for the new joint of the day. Now, you may remember him as one of the many littles that came on the scene in the 90s. Well, now he's dropped the little and started on a new album due to come out this summer. It's called The Big Zane Theory. The Big Zane Theory was just the Big Bang Theory. You know what I'm saying? That You ever heard of that? I thought it was a clever, just the Big Zane. Like, what's the big deal about Zane? But they took it as like, oh, he just wants to be Zane now. I'm like, nah, it wasn't it. So they changed my name. And back then, you records were really being printed up. So when you went to Walmart or to the record store Best Buy to buy a Lil Zane album and you went into L's, it wasn't there no more. So I feel like the label kind of like sabotaged my album in a way by switching from Lil Zane is the biggest thing in the world. Why would you go from Lil Zane to just Zane? I don't think they was thinking about that. I don't think they thought about it being in a whole different column as far as alphabets. And, and believe it or not, I think that hurt a lot. Big Tigger and I'm doing my thing. I got my man Little Zane. Excuse me, he changed the name to Big Zane. And it goes along with the album title, Freestyle Recital. Who you know twist bras like a dime a dozen. A dozen dimes being gone, make them lie on their cousin. Tell they man I was with her last night sleeping. Knowing damn well you was rolling with Z creeping. Who you know? Big Tig and my smile big is cheery. I'm putting it down with Zane. It's the Big Zane Theory. theory. August 1-9 to be in your stores. Big Tigger coming back with that uncut roar. So my second album, man. At this point, Priority got bought by Capital. They got bought by Capital in the middle of doing my second album. They merged. So when things like that happen, there's a new shift of people. The same people that were over my project wasn't over this new. It kind of, uh, that kind of caused something. Um, they only pressed up 30,000 copies of my second album. I sold all 30,000. So people say, well, why you have a second album and you only sold 30,000? That's all they printed up. So I really sold all of them, but I remember being places where I'd be doing autograph signings and I would have to call the label like, yo, there's no records in the store. Like we got 500 people standing outside, but there's only three records in the store. The only thing that I feel like saved my second album was the fact that I had a song called Tonight of Yours that I featured the artist Tank on. Tank was the biggest artist at that time, um, R&B artist. He had the I Deserve out and um, he was cool. He was loving my music. Him and Tyrese was cool. Tyrese introduced me to him and um, I put Tank on the Tank on Tonight I'm Yours. And the streets actually took that record and made it what it was. Where it was one of the first songs that that hit ringtones and we did really good on ring on the ringtones and you know, shout out to my boy Tank, but that's what really saved the album, that single, and um, thank God for that, <laughs> definitely. I started really, really pursuing my acting career when the label started bullshit, and they started making me feel like they were, they were just sitting on my project, and I needed another way to get some money. I think acting um, saved me. I came out in an era where a lot of artists was getting taken advantage of. Me jumping into the acting industry kind of like gave me another life. Tell me how you know Beyonce. We're doing a film together. I just met her. We're, on a, we're working on a film called Fighting Temptation for Paramount and um, working with her alongside her every day. You know what I mean? Now, who are you? I don't know if you've seen One on One, Moesha, The Parker Show, um, all those type of shows that we grew up loving. I just, you know, I, I just threw myself in the TV world, so. Everything that happened, I put on myself just because I'm not, I'm not a finger pointer. Like a lot of fans or whatever, they ask me, why this happened? Like, a lot of stuff was just out of my control. Like, I didn't have the control I have now, creatively or financially, to really make those decisions at the time. I thought when I became an entertainer that every day was going to be good. Like, once I get this money and I get on TV, ain't no more bad days. But then you learn that after you become famous, you know, you still have bad days. My bad days might just be a little bit different from yours, you know? But we still have bad days. My only regret that I have in my career is just um, not really, really, really taking my time in the early days to learn the business of it. I got taken advantage of a lot at the beginning because I didn't understand the business. I didn't know it's 90% business, 10% music. I wasn't thinking about that. So my advice would be to anybody getting into the music industry is just learn the business before you just throw yourself into something. And um, also, I wanna say this, stay confident. You know what I'm saying? It was a point in my career where I let the label talk me out of doing what I always knew to do.
my second album came out, they changed my second album from Lil Zane to Zane. That's not something I would have did. My grandma called me Lil Zane. My dad is Big Zane. I never changed my name. Oh, I want you to rap this way. I want to bring these writers in. So, you know, I, I think that took away from the essence for a while, you know? Because people love Lil Zane for what he brought to the table. I wrote Anywhere. I wrote Money Stretch. I wrote Calling Me. I wrote all my hits. So the second album came out and they tried to bring people in. That kind of took my confidence away a little bit, you know what I mean? So the only thing I ever would tell an artist, never let them, never let anybody steal your confidence. You know what I'm saying? As far as if you doing something and it's working, don't let nobody take you out of that. I live a life of a celebrity. I made nigga way bigger than the mother catch you love to see. I'm getting paid like I'm supposed to. My homies call me on my mobile one and hang. We still close to. After I got away from the label, got my focus back. You know what I'm saying? Put the do rag back on, put the hat back to the back, and was like, you know what I'm saying? I'm Lil Zane again. I'm totally in control of my of my situation. I'm totally independent. Um, in the best position I think as an artist I've ever been in in my life. I'm making the best music I think I ever made in my life. I think me coming in so young, I got an advantage because now I just kind of been through it all. I'll take my own money and put my own toy together and that's what I learned about being independent. Like, you can't be scared to invest in yourself. And I look in the camera when I say that, like, a lot of artists want people to invest millions in them, but they, if they had the millions, they wouldn't invest it in themselves. So I had to learn to bank on me. I say, twist, a true player smoking purple hair. Two shots in the air for my true thugs out there. Yeah. I'm a father. I have two kids. I have a daughter that's seven, a son that's eight. As a father, I am, I think I'm a good father. I think I could always be better, you know what I mean? But my kids love me to death. They know I love them. Um, I think I try to be a fun dad. You know, I'm a fun dad. I, I want my kids to be able to chop it up with me like I was able to chop it up with my dad. And um, I'm constantly schooling them. You know, I make, even if they ain't got, a, got homework, I make my kids read a book for 30 minutes every day. I try to just install in them just to be good people, you know, and um, that's who I am right now. I'm, I'm the superstar at night. I'm a daddy daycare. In the daytime, Zaddy Daycare, get it right. Zaddy Daycare, not Daddy Daycare, Zaddy Daycare. The legacy I want to leave behind, I want to be an example of don't give up, believe in yourself. And it's over when you say it's over. You just got to stick to your guns, stick with what you know, and be yourself, man. I think this whole, this whole time I could say I actually, I want to leave, leave a legacy of people say, you know what, he was always the same person. Whether he was money, whether he was up or down, he always had a smile on his face. He always was telling somebody something positive. I don't feel like I'm better than nobody. I feel like we both got the same 24 hours to do what we do. Whatever I do, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm about changing lives and making broke rich, you know what I'm saying? So that's, that's what I'm about. And you're gonna see a lot of me because I feel like it ain't over. You know what I'm saying? How that, how that movie, it ain't over for me. That hustle and flow, I feel like the dude that hustle and flow, like, I feel like I got so much more to get to the world. And again, man, I don't even know what I'm gonna do 10 years from now. I just know it's gonna be something big. And if you want it, we could do it in the black 500 with the top down and overdrive when we ride cause I'm hot now. You got me going, I don't think I wanna stop now. Z feeling like a criminal on lockdown. So let's get away to get away. You getting hot, baby, please don't melt away. I got a crib on a beach, Paul, metal away. And here's your personal keys to see me every day, 112. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs>